Hey friends, welcome to our August webinar. I'm so excited to be with you guys. Uh, it is so incredibly hot outside. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today, just talking about what you need to be doing in your bees with this kind of heat. There's a lot of unique management things that come into play this month. Uh, we've got, uh, we're, we'll be talking about the dearth, we'll be talking about feeding bees, and then we'll be talking about what you don't need to be doing in your bees this month as well. Because you know, we don't have to be doing as much to our bees in the month of August as we do certainly in the spring. So um, I do want to mention that uh, I am, well, first of all, my name's Blake. I'm one of the owners of the Bee Supply if we haven't met. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we did have a bit of a snafu uh, when it came to creating this webinar live. So we did our live recording. I was actually out of town, which you'll see me mention in my Bee Yard video. Um, and uh, Sherry and Charlie and James did a wonderful job with the live Q&A that you're going to hear later tonight. Uh, but we had a little tech glitch in the beginning of this webinar uh, that kind of messed up the recording. So, so Sherry and I are just uh, re-recording the very beginning of this, and then we'll jump out to the B yard, and then you'll go to the live uh, Q&A with, with Charlie. So... Um, so quick reminder, we do still have summer bees available. The big thing I want to mention here is that time is virtually gone. and We're only selling summer bees for a couple more weeks. And really, we could sell bees, you know, through the fall, but we don't because we want to make sure that this complete hive has time to build up before winter. And so we stop selling bees in late August because that's when we kind of feel like, okay, if you buy them in late August, um, you put a honey super on, you feed them. They still have enough time since it's a complete hot. They still have enough time to build up for the winter. But past late August, you know, we really don't want to keep selling them because we want to make sure they've got time to build up for you. But we still do have to deal. We do still have some available uh, in, in all of our branches in Austin, Dallas and Houston. So you can pick one of those up. We also have uh, our ultimate summer feed which is global with Apis Biologics or Rocket Fuel and global with Complete. Those are available now. So I highly recommend giving your bees some of these pollen patties, really starting now in August. And we'll talk about that out in the bee yard. But these are really, really great at helping get your bees through the summer dearth that we're experiencing. Um, and then we also have uh, Stan's Sugar Bricks back in stock. So this is really exciting, and I'll talk about that out in the uh, bee yard as well, how to feed these sugar bricks and why to feed them um, over the course of the summer. Uh, the last thing I want to mention before we get to the magazine with Sherry is just look at this drought map. It's getting hot. It's getting dry. And that's why we really start focusing in on those pollen patties, the sugar bricks, doing some trickle feeding, which I've got a video out in the bee yard on how to do trickle feeding. So this will be a big point that we'll be talking about tonight but not every area is is in a drought but most areas are getting very very dry so you know where i live up in north texas which is that little white spot you see on the map there up on the upper right side of texas even though we're not technically in a drought it hasn't rained in several weeks and it, everything is dying so that's when we really have to start leaning into bee care to make sure that our bees have the nutrients they need to survive these really dearth, hot, dry dearth periods. So Sherry, uh, tell us about this month's magazine. I know it's a good one. I love that cover photo. But tell, tell us a bit about what's going on. Yes. I, I'd love to. I tell you, I think in that drought chart you show, we're we're over 75 days, no rain here in Southeast Texas. <laughs> it's a little parched. Yes, I love that cover. Those boxes stacked up that. How many of us have seen that? And those aren't painted yet. It's just in the light penetrating through. I love it. You know, that this uh, August issue is packed full. We're kind of wrapping up the end of um, the extraction season from the previous month. So if you've got more questions about that, revert back to the July issue, but we're wrapping it up in the August issue. We have Mr. Ed in that August issue, my interview with him, which is super great. He's such a super cool guy. Um, symptoms of nutritionally starved hives, Thinking outside of the hive box, a new little series that I started, um, been working on, and it's, you've heard of thinking outside the box, thinking outside the hive box. Those of you that have come up with some really cool ideas 
of doing beekeeping, whether that's extraction or just the daily management of bees, it's just a super outside of the box idea, um, send it to me because I'm really getting a library of, I don't have many yet, but send it to me if you've got some, because I'm, I'm loving these ideas. We all need to be um, using them. It'll save us time. And Beekeeping Scams, um, super article by Lynn Jones this month. Uh, social media is full of scammers, and we know that just in our everyday lives, somebody's trying to get something for nothing. Um, really good information in that article. Go to this issue and, and read that. I think you'll learn a lot. I learned a lot by reading what her research um, revealed. So that's a good one. That's a good one. All right. You ready for me to do the spotlight, Blake? Let's do that. All right, so I picked this article, How to Price Your Honey. I wrote this just for you, actually, because I kept getting contacted about how do you price your honey? And I kept seeing it on the, on uh, social media, uh, Facebook, of how do I price my honey? And you've got folks all over the nation, anywhere from, and I love this, $20 an ounce. And I'm thinking, gosh, I wish I could do that. Um, to a dollar an ounce, you know, this is really crazy, some really super cheap, some really expensive. And in this article, I really laid out how we price our honey. I mean, I can't tell you how to do it, but I can tell you the logistics. I'm a very, uh, James as well, very logistical person. Everything has to line up. And I lay it out in that article, it, even going as far as what the uh, commodities market what uh, the USDA National Honey Report talks about. We don't use that as a guide because right now that's at about 226 to 280 a pound. We don't want that as our benchmark. Um, but as far as honey production, how it costs, how much it costs you to produce your honey, what your market is, you know, your market is where you live. Your, your friends can be your competition. And that's where it gets a little dicey. But I hope that in this article, I lay it out where you can really feel comfortable about what you've got and where your price point is and make you feel better about it. Plus, hopefully you can sell some and not carry some over to the next year. So check it out. It's a good article, I think, even if I wrote it myself. <laughs> Thanks, Blake. I I, you bet. I, and I love that article. That is, you're right. That is such a need. I get so many questions on how on earth do I price my honey. So thanks for writing that because it's, it's a great, great overview of, of what to do and, and how to do it. So cool. Well, hey guys, with that, um, we're going to jump out to the bee yard and see what the bees are doing. And then we'll come back for a live Q and A with, um, Sherry and, um, Charlie. So see you in the bee yard. Hey friends, oh man, man, welcome to summer. It is so hot. Most areas are getting pretty dry. Um, what few flowers are left are certainly starting to burn up as extreme of heat as we've had across much of the South. Um, even like the central United States and the Southeast a little bit are getting pretty dry, like we'll see in our webinar later tonight. I mean, things are starting to cook everywhere. Um, you know, in the central and northern United States, you know, there's the hives are still producing honey, but they only have, in most cases, a couple weeks left. So nationwide, certainly in the South, you know, we're entering or we're fully in that dearth period. Now, one thing we'll take a look at in these hives is, you know, how are they coping with, coping with varroa mites? How are they coping with the heat? Uh, but as we're paying so much attention to our bees, pay attention to how you're handling the heat too. I mean, don't go work your bees at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you know, it's, it's six o'clock, almost six o'clock when I'm filming this and it's still crazy hot. So work your bees first thing in the morning, work them late in the day, wear a ventilated bee suit like this. Um, you know, do take steps to stay cool. Uh, wear shorts and a t-shirt underneath your bee suit. Um, don't stay out there too long. Uh, make sure you're taking care of yourself as you check your bees. And your bees don't need a whole lot of care this time of year. The main thing is you know, making sure they're fed properly, uh, making sure their varroa mites are taken care of, and that's about it. You know, I mean, as long as, um, you know, you've got at least a couple of boxes on your hive to help keep them cool, you're pretty much good to go. So pay attention to food, which is what we'll talk a lot about today, and then pay attention to varroa mites. And beyond that, you don't have to be spending, you know, an hour in your hive once a week. I mean, those, you know, you can a few minutes every other week is all you really need this time of year. So in and out quickly, it's better for you, better for the bees. 
Um, as you've already heard, I am not there for the, for the monthly buzz tonight. I'm sorry. Um, I am actually on a trip in Alaska right now uh, when you're watching this. So I'm filming this a few days before. Um, so I apologize. Please don't hate me. But uh, it's about 65 degrees where I am. And uh, so my apologies to all of you suffering through the heat waves in the south. Um, but I'll be back in a couple days and back into the bee yard. So, um, but I know Sherry and James and Charlie are doing a phenomenal job. Um, huge thank you to Sherry for just taking and running with the program tonight. I think this is, this is actually the first monthly buzz I've missed since we started, which is right about three years ago. So I really appreciate the break. Thank you, Sherry. And I look forward to being back with you guys in September. But in the meantime, let's jump out into the bees and see what they're doing in this heat. Hey friends, so this hive was actually a summer split. And so I'm pretty curious to take a look at it and just see how they're progressing. You know, it can be really hard to get bees to grow during the summer months. Um, one thing that we found, I talked about it in some of our other videos, but feeding a hive complete, which is a mixture that we sell, it's got about 157 different ingredients in it, um, can really help bees grow uh, in the summertime. And so when I'm trying to get hives to grow, whether it's splits or just weak hives in the summer, I love using complete. Now we've got this top box on them uh, in, uh, just because it's hot outside and this is giving them a little bit more of a heat barrier. But really what we want to explore is what's going on in the second brood box. So this hive, we've got our mite treatment in. So we've got our Apivar strips in to treat for mites. And you can check out our previous videos. We've done some videos on how to treat for varroa mites. And uh, wow, so this is, this hive is really going crazy. So even though this is a split, the new queen has been accepted and we've got just a ton of fresh new brood. So you can see we've got this beautiful band of honey around the outside edge. We've got tons of cat brood and eggs and larvae um, all around the, in the center of the frame. Good bee population. So I'm really happy with this hive so far. You know, even though they were split fairly recently, that new queen is out, she's laying, um, she is doing a wonderful job of laying. We've got several frames of brood up here in this top box. Now, one thing I really like to do and, and really strongly recommend is that when you're making summer splits, that you give them quite a bit of brood. You know, you want to give them at least four frames of brood during the summer uh, rather than spring when you might be able to get away with two or three frames of brood. You know, in those summer months, give them, you know, three, I'm sorry, four, maybe even five frames of brood so that they can really make sure that uh, they grow enough before winter gets here. So you can see, I mean, again, we've got all this capped honey around the outside edge. The other side of this frame is a beautiful frame of completely capped honey. Now, obviously, this hive has been fed heavily since we made a split, but it's got the ratios that I'm really, really looking for. Um, they've got about four frames of brood up in this top box. They've got about three or four good frames of honey. So I would estimate that it's about 40, 30 to 40 pounds of honey up here in the second box. And then all I'm focusing on now that I've got my mite treatment in, all I'm focusing on now is maintaining. So this hive just needs to maintain. So my mite treatment is going to make sure my mites are under control. Um, I'm going to maybe give them, you know, maybe a quarter gallon of syrup every other week just so they can uh, maintain the weight that they have. But that's about it. I'm going to probably give them another few rounds of complete so that they keep that brood rearing going until they fully bounce back from the split. But uh, pretty low maintenance from here on out. Now, I don't know if you can see in the video, but the queen is right here by my thumb. So. You certainly don't have to see the queen, but all you really need to see is eggs and larvae. So I'm really happy with this hive, even though it's a split, it's growing. They've got plenty of brood. I've got my mite treatments in. I've got 40 pounds of honey in the second box. I have my third box on top to help keep them cool. 
there's really not a lot I have to do at this point. I'm just going to let them coast through the, the rest of the summer. Um, I would just recommend, you know, giving them, again, maybe a quarter gallon of syrup every other week, maybe a half a gallon, so that they maintain the weight that they have. Um, it wouldn't hurt, as we're giving them complete, to give them a pollen patty. So maybe as you give them that quarter gallon to half gallon every other week, I'm also going to give them a pollen patty. And again, it's just because I need them to grow since they're a split. But overall, this hive looks great, and they should... Uh, be a fantastic hive ready to roll by the time winter gets here. So I talk quite a bit about something that I've been calling for years trickle feeding. Now trickle feeding is as a concept uh, nothing new necessarily um, but I started pushing it several years ago and it's kind of caught on as a, as a concept and and here's the theory. So as our bees are trying to survive a summer dearth so if you're in an area that has you know, a couple months uh, long period where there's not a lot of flowers blooming, not a lot of pollen coming in. Um, it's a bee hive's tendency to dramatically shrink down. The worse the dearth is, the more the hive shrinks. If it's a bad enough dearth, it's a hot and dry enough year, your hive can shrink down so much that it's hard for them to rebound enough in the fall to be big and strong enough to survive the winter. And so while it's certainly okay and appropriate to let our hive grow and then contract as the seasons change, that's perfectly natural for them, there is a limit at which we don't want to let them contract too much on particularly hot, dry, poor years where they can't rebound from that. So there are times as beekeepers that we step in. Um, or if your bees are your pets and they're in your backyard and you just want to take as good care of them as you possibly can, um, you can take a few simple steps to ensure their health throughout the summer. You know, something like trickle feeding or pollen patties, it's great insurance for bees. While it may not be necessary every single year for their survival, um, every other year it might be necessary for their survival, and it's hard to predict, uh, you know, ahead of time which year it's going to have been necessary. And so as a general rule of thumb, a lot of beekeepers like to practice pollen patty feeding, or trickle feeding throughout the dearth period just to be safe. So here's how you can trickle feed. The concept is you're giving your hive small amounts of food over a long period of time during a dearth. So usually starting in, you know, well usually starting when you pull your honey, whether that's early July or late July or early August, you know, when you harvest honey up until the point at which, um, you know, daytime temperatures are in the 60s, um, between those two periods, you're going to be trickle feeding. And it's really simple. Um, we've got this hive. The honey has been harvested off of it. Um, we put our honey super back up on top so the bees can clean it out. Also gives them, gives them a bit of a hot air buffer because it's really hot underneath the lid. It certainly doesn't hurt anything. Um, this hive in particular has about, let's see, it's got about 20 pounds or less of honey in the second box. So they're a little on the light side. I really like for them to maintain more like 30 pounds of honey in the second box. Um, and so it's, it's really simple. You can, if they, if they need to put on weight, then I'm going to get my syrup. Here's my syrup. And I'm going to give them about a fourth to a half of a gallon of syrup every two weeks or so. Um, you can do it as frequently as every week, as infrequently as every two weeks. There's no real science behind it. If your hive only has, you know, five pounds of honey in it and it's almost starving, well, you know, give them a half a gallon every week until they catch up. But, you know, if they've got two, three, four frames of honey in the second box, they're not starving, um, then you're just wanting to give them a trickle of syrup. That helps stimulate the queen. It helps reassure them they've got food present um, and they don't have to panic. And uh, it, it helps... Their, keeps their momentum going. So I'm going to take off my second box. I've already got my mite treatment in this hive, which is really important. So I'm going to give them about a fourth of a gallon of syrup. I've got one of our global pollen patties um, with complete in it, which is my favorite supplement in the summer months. 
So I've got my pollen patty. I'm just going to put it directly on the top of the bottom, or the, the, directly on the top bars on my bottom box. And I'm just going to return that top box. Put my empty box back up on top. That's kind of my heat barrier. Simple as that. Takes less than a minute. Fourth to a half gallon of syrup, a pollen patty, and I'll come back in roughly two weeks and do the same thing. Now, one exception is that if this box already has quite a bit of honey in it, you know, if they've already got 40 pounds roughly of honey in it, or these two boxes combined have about 40 pounds of honey in it, you don't have to give them a lot of food. One thing you can do is give them one of Stan's soft sugar bricks, um, which we make. And these work great because they're not gonna put on a lot of weight to the hive. It's not like giving them syrup that they're just gonna store directly in the frames. This isn't gonna make your hive put on a lot of weight, uh, but it will give them some essential, nutri essential nutrients. It'll give them some carbs, a little bit of protein, and it'll stimulate them to keep rearing brood. And it's just a, a healthy little snack for them <laughs> as they try to endure this winter dearth. So you can feed it whether you're feeding sugar syrup or not, but if your hive is on the heavy side and doesn't necessarily need sugar water, you can give them a pollen patty and one of these sugar bricks and they're really going to do well through the dearth. Now, since it's hot outside, these sugar bricks can be a little on the softer side, but you know what? The bees don't care and it's actually, it's easier for them to eat if it's a little bit softer. Um, if it's really mushy, you can actually just leave it on the cardboard. So when you pull this out of the package, um, it'll, it'll be, the bottom side will be on a cardboard. And you can see this is on a little bit on the mushy side. So you can, uh, there's a couple of different ways you can apply this during the summer. You can uh, get an empty box with no frames in it. And you can um, put it down inside that box. You can get a rim, you know, a two inch rim and set it on here um, so that uh, so the bees can really get above it. Um, or you can leave it directly on the cardboard and just put it directly on top. And now you've created a little bit of a, a ventilation crack in that hive for the bees. And so they'll get a little bit of ventilation and then they can also work on eating that sugar brick. Now, in most cases, I do recommend though that you go ahead and put some sort of a rim or just an empty shallow or medium super with no frames on it on top so the bees have plenty of room to get around that uh, sugar brick and eat it. And the cool thing is, um, I'm gonna show this to you guys. I'm gonna have to take my camera apart to show you. But uh, the bees are already all over this sugar brick, which is always just so cool to see. So you literally just saw me stick it on top of this hive. Look at those bees. See all those bees around it? They are already just gobbling on <laughs> that sugar brick. Uh, they love these things. So you can see they are already like in 30 seconds, they are already all over this sugar brick. So the bees just love them. And it's a, it's a, great, a great supplement to feed them over the summer months. So, um, so that works really well. And like I said, they tend to be a little on the soupy side because it's hot outside. So you can just leave it on that cardboard and that prevents it from melting down into the hive. And if it breaks apart some, that's okay. I mean, that's actually, it's easier for the bees to eat it if it breaks apart a little bit. Um, sometimes I like to actually intentionally break it apart a bit. Um, and then I'm also not afraid to take it off that cardboard completely and let it break apart onto the hive. And again, that just helps the bees eat it that much faster. You can scrape the excess off the cardboard directly onto the top bars. And I know it seems messy, but again, the bees don't care at all. They will be able to eat it faster and utilize it more quickly than if it wasn't, uh, than if it was together in a hard brick. So it's a great way to trickle feed your hives um, it's simple. The concept is just a little bit of food over a long period of time. So I talk a lot about feeding bees, you know, when to feed bees, how to feed bees. It's such an important part of 
proper management, especially during dearth periods. But we're gonna take a look at this hive, and this hive is a good example of when you don't need to feed in the summer months. This hive has, we've actually already identified this hive as having a little bit too much food, and we've added this spare box on top so that they can move some of that honey out of the brood nest up into that empty honey super. This time of year, I'm going for, you know, in the summer dearth, I'm going for about 20 to 40 pounds of excess food in the second box. So that's my goal, 20 to 40 pounds. So that's a deep box, about half full, half to two thirds full of honey, or a medium box that's almost completely full of honey. So that's, that's kind of my target. You know, a medium box, two thirds full, or a deep box, a third, you know, half full is okay as well. You know, you're going for that, you know, 20, 30, 40 pound range. I'm, I'm usually hitting in the 20 to 30 pound range this time of year, because I want to leave plenty of room for uh, brood. A quick way to gauge this is just cracking up, cr cracking your two boxes apart and just lifting up on that top box and getting a good guess for how much weight it is. It might take a little bit of practice, but I can tell you just by lifting, this top box has probably 50 pounds of honey in it. You can dive down a little bit deeper and investigate to confirm that that is the case and just pull out some of these frames and see you know, are they full of honey, are they empty, or are they full of brood? You know, this time of year I'm looking for both. You know, I'm looking for some frames full of honey, you know, three, four frames full of brood in the top box, some frames full of honey, and maybe an empty frame. You can see this is completely full of honey. Completely full of honey. We've got our Apivar strip there. Um, it's got a little bit of extra space in the middle, but not a lot. And virtually every single frame in this top box is the same way. You know, it's just completely full of honey. A little bit of capped drone brood right there in the middle. It's always a sign of a healthy hive. So, but by and large, you know, every single frame in this top box is full of honey. And I'm not really going for that this time of year. Now, if this were October, you know, and we were going into the winter months, I would be okay with that. But we're still a few months away from that. And so I wanna make sure that my queen has plenty of room to lay. So if I've got 50 pounds of honey stored up here, what I'm going to do is I'm not gonna feed them any sugar water uh, or syrup. Now I still will give them a pollen patty and that'll help keep that brood rearing going and help them eat through some of this food. Um, the only thing I'm really going to do though, other than treating for mites and maybe giving them a pollen patty, is I'm going to take this medium box that was my honey super. So it's got drawn out frames, but no honey or syrup in it. And I'm going to put it right on top. Never a bad idea to keep that heat from bearing down right on top of the brood nest. But also it gives my bees the choice. You know, if they want to move some of that honey out of the brood nests up into this top box to clear some space in case the queen wants to lay more, they now have that option. They're not gonna be honey bound. So I'll come back, I'll leave them like this. I'm gonna give them a pollen patty and I'll come back in you know, three weeks or so and just check and make sure those honey stores are still good. Um, you know, if they're down to you know, maybe 20 pounds of honey, I might give them a gallon of syrup. But probably with this hive, They've got so much honey in that second box, it's mostly full. I probably won't have to feed this hive at all until next spring. So with this hive that already has all the honey they need, I'm just gonna be focusing on making sure my varroa mites are under control and giving them a few pollen patties um, every other week or so up until you know late October. And that's it. Hive management is pretty simple at this point once they've already got that stockpile of food. Okay, so I've identified this hive as a hive that's not very strong. They've pretty much just got one box with bees and brood in it, and I've added this empty box on top because I don't like single-story hives out in the sun for long periods of time in the hot Texas summers. I like getting that second box up on top just to give them a little bit of a heat barrier from that, you know, those 100 degree days. So, but this hive is on the weaker side. You know, it's, it doesn't have a whole lot of brood. It's got a laying queen. Um, we're feeding them 
we're giving them pollen patties and we've taken care of the varroa mites, so the essentials are taken care of, but they're just not as strong. Uh, they were a later split, um, later in the year, and they just aren't as strong as some of these other hives. You can see this other hive over here. I mean, we've got bees fanning all over the place um, and, and it's packed full of bees. So all I'm gonna do with this hive, now that I've made sure varroa mites are under control, I'm feeding them, you know, the basics are covered, I'm just gonna take a frame of brood from my stronger hive and give it to my weaker hive. And I'm just gonna illustrate quickly how to do that. It doesn't take long. I'm just gonna open up my weak hive and I'm gonna pull one of the frames from the outside edge. This frame happens to be mostly foundation. So it's, you know, they've, they've started drawing out the comb on this side. This side is still foundation. So I'm gonna pull a frame from the outside edge and I'm going to open up a space in the middle of the hive. So you can see I've opened up a space right in the middle of the hive, right between the current frames of brood. I'm gonna to go to my really strong hive. I'm just gonna open them right up. And I'm gonna pull a frame of brood, ideally mostly cap brood because I want them to, I want my weaker hive not to have to do much work taking care of this brood. So this is a frame, a beautiful frame of eggs and larvae. I'm gonna set it aside because I want them again to have a frame of cat brood. Okay, so here's a frame of mostly cat brood. I'm gonna see if I can find one that's almost completely cat brood just for the fun of it. So it looks like I don't, I don't see one. I've got lots of honey up here and lots of frames of eggs and larvae. So I could go down into the second box, but um, you know what? It's hot and I'm tired and I don't wanna go down the second box. So <laughs> that's the, the choice you get to make as a beekeeper sometimes. So I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look carefully for the queen. Um, I don't see the queen on this frame. If you're not confident in your ability to find the queen, just go ahead and shake all the bees off into this hive. If you're pretty confident that you can spot the queen and, and you don't see her on here, you can leave the bees on. And you can see this is a frame mostly of cat brood. It's got some uh, uncapped larvae around the edges, but it's pretty much a frame of cat brood. So I made sure the queen wasn't on here. I'm actually gonna take these bees and I'm gonna shake them off in front of the hive. Now, because this was a frame of brood, um, most of the bees on this frame were larvae. I'm, I'm, <laughs> most of the bees uh, on this frame were nurse bees, and they usually integrate into a new hive really quickly and easily. So by shaking them off in the front, the nurse bees tend to go right into the weaker hive and integrate into that new hive with no problem. The older foragers that aren't gonna integrate well into a hive, they'll just fly away back to the old hive. So then I'm just gonna put this frame a brood right in the middle of this hive. Push the frames tightly back together. And on my strong hive over here that I took the brood from, this uh, frame of foundation that we took out of the weaker hive, I'm just gonna put it on the outside edge. So I'm gonna push all the frames tightly together. I'm putting my frame of foundation on the outside edge. And I'm done, simple as that. So that's pretty much it, friends. I mean, you know, the goal is to just do some quick visits on your bees. Beekeeping work isn't super intensive this time of year. The goal is just to make sure varroa mites are under control, make sure the bees aren't starving to death. <laughs> you know, that's important. And then uh, beyond that, you know, you can come check your bees every couple of weeks and uh, do the trickle feeding. Uh, I recommend that. If your bees are close to you and they're in your backyard, then trickle feeding works great. You know, if you're driving 45 minutes to work your bees and you're wanting to go on vacation, you know, you can give them a gallon of feed and a pollen patty and come back in three weeks and, uh, and, and your hive's just gonna be fine. The, the big thing is handle varroa mites and whatever method you choose, handle varroa mites. That's the key thing you don't wanna be late or behind the curve on. Um, other than that, it's pretty simple this time of year. Um, if you do want to requeen, if you have a hive that hasn't been requeened in over a year, or you've got a hive that, you know, every frame, the brood pattern's really, really spotty, this isn't a bad time to requeen hives. We've got queens available. 
Um, and the key thing is make sure if you're going to requeen a hive, feed them for a week before you requeen and feed them a week after you requeen. You know, give them, give them a couple gallons of syrup before and a half a gallon or a gallon of syrup after. That's really going to up the odds that they accept that queen. Um, bee simulating a natural nectar flow really, again, ups those odds of them accepting a new queen. Um, I want to give a shout out. I mean, I'm not usually in this bee yard. I'm usually in uh, the bee yard um, at the sheriff's department that we help manage um, in McKinney, Texas. I'm often at that bee yard. This is our bee yard at our uh, TBS store in Blue Ridge, Texas. And uh, it's been a minute since I've been in this yard. And I came in um, looking for some problems to show you guys. I was looking for a hive that varroa mites were out of control. Um, I was looking for some starving hives. I was looking for <laughs> all these things. And these hives are amazing. And so a huge shout out to Shannon LaGrave. She works for TBS. She's an amazing beekeeper in our Blue Ridge store. Um, and she's done an amazing job with these bees. They really look fantastic. Um, so I didn't find the problems I was hoping to find, and that's always a good day in the bee yard. So big shout out to Shannon for managing these hot. Um, with that, let's jump back into the webinar and Cheryl will take it from here. So um, real quick, before I introduce the, the almighty Charlie <laughs> Bee Company here, um, I want to say that I concur with Blake on the hives that are um, at the stores. So James and I taught at uh, the Dayton store for three years almost. And to keep teaching hives looking good, you'll concur with this, Charlie Agar, it's tough. And the fact that Shannon and Kim Townsend, she's another instructor up there, they keep these premier hives. I'm gonna tell you, it's a struggle because when you're in them all the time and then you add heat and everything, crazy. Hey, so this dude that's sitting beside me here, I've known him for a minute. His name's Charlie Agar. He's kind of, <laughs> he's kind of famous. Charlie's kind of famous. And we know him. Um, hey man, you got a bee on your back there. <laughs> Charlie, um, Charlie Agar is is famous because he is such a huge hit on a um um what do you call it? A um reality TV. And it's Charlie B Company, and you're on PBS, and um, go ahead and say hi, and I'm going to read something about you. Sure, yeah, so uh, some of you have seen the show. I get a lot of good emails from folks, um, and it's actually playing right now on a station called EarthX. It's a new cable channel out of Dallas, really interesting folks, and um, I, season two is playing. There's a couple episodes out, more to come, and then it'll also run on PBS starting in Austin and then it'll fan out across at least Texas if not uh, America and the rest America. of the world so we're we're excited season two has been awesome you know the uh, the the bee supply people are in it Blake Shook who is like EF Hutton if you're old enough to remember those EF Hutton commercials when EF Hutton talks people listen so okay. when, when Blake speaks I I I I prick my ears right up because he always has good information or confirms what I'm doing or something new. He's just always, always thinking about the bees. But uh, we have an awesome episode chasing Blake and his whole team around the country, all the way to the Central Valley of California, Idaho. You know, it's uh, it, and we get to see the whole process of this larger commercial beekeepers. We get behind the scenes with um, smaller operations, uh, natural beekeepers, the, 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 the non-treatment, you know, top bar beekeepers, and just kind of learn from all kinds of different people. I went under a building looking for black widow spiders with the spider lady in Nacogdoches. And, uh, you know, I thought I'd be, I, I thought they'd kill you. They don't. So we kind of learned all about spiders as a cousin of bees. And so anyway, season two is a hoot. Check it out. Yeah, that, that one, I don't want to watch that. I mean, I, maybe on, I don't know, I, I'll listen to it. I'm not sure I can see that. So it was so funny because I do know um, quite a bit about your history, but I, I pulled up your website while I get or this afternoon um, just to see what you had on there. And I love the about you. Y'all pull up his website. It's uh, charliebcompany.com, charliebee.com, my apologies, charliebee.com. Uh, Charlie's road to beekeeping was no bee line, though. He once worked in the fisheries of Alaska, ski bummed in Colorado, taught English in Japan, and crisscrossed South and Southeast Asia for years. 
adventures that morphed into a career as a guidebook writer and later a newspaper reporter. <laughs> Man. My, my grandmother always said that I had a bad case of, uh, she called it itchy feet, wanderlust. My grandfather had it too. And I've always, I've always done things that interest me. Um, yeah didn't necessarily make a million bucks and um but i always follow my passions and for years that was writing and uh travel and uh, yeah just all kinds of different things so but and you know, what's wrong with that i mean getting some, a little of something i mean who had not thought that i'd have been a writer and a magazine editor at I'm not going to say my age. <laughs> At I, this think, age. <laughs> I think millennials and Gen Z, Z folks kind of get that. They seem yeah. to be very entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and not going, trying to go the corporate route. I never went kind of a corporate route at all. And, uh, you know, it was unconventional at the time. Whereas I think now gig economy, you know, people are saying, I'm not going to saddle myself with a mortgage. I'm going to go to Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I did just that and I don't regret it and, uh, all the time <laughs> all the time that's so cool though Charlie so I'm going to get you to help me with some um, giving these folks some information okay sure. instead of playing slides games since we kind of got a little bit of a late start we're just going to talk bees and and this is my I mean you know I interview somebody every month and um, I, I it's what I do. So let's just do that. Let's just talk bees and not do the, the PowerPoint. Um, snow on the prairie, snow on the mountain. Okay, folks, everybody that has bees out anywhere near a pasture somewhere, I was shocked. It's only August 3rd and we've got reports of snow on the prairie. It's, um, it looks in my area, of course, I'm Southeast Texas, James and I are Southeast Texas. Um, looks like goat weed from a distance, but it's not. It's it's kind of a, a, a not what two foot tall plant, and it's got little snowy little little blooms on the ends of it, and it will ruin perfectly good honey. Am I wrong? So I I've made the mistake of harvesting fall honey when I was a <laughs> new beekeeper and had just a few hives. I got so excited about going to the farmer's market with honey. I thought, oh, well, the bees are building up again this here in September. So why don't I just pull some of this? And yeah. and I guess some the stuff I pulled tasted OK to me, but I put it on the shelf at the farmer's market and there's nothing worse than having people call you or reach out and say, this honey tastes bad. It's, it's, that's the opposite of marketing, you know? It's like, so uh, yeah, that was a bummer. It was a good lesson. I should yeah. have listened to someone like Blake or, or a, a mentor. I just kind of went on, went off script and uh, yeah, pull, pull your honey. I, I think there's still time, right? I mean, they're, they're not. There is, there is. And, and you know, we, we're being watched by folks all over the nation. It's not just, not just here. So um, really and truly, people further north probably don't even know what that is, but um, it really is a um, tart, not tart, kind of a bitter taste that just will completely run it. Bees don't care, but it's, uh, hey, Steve, somebody, Steve said that we didn't say what the name of your show was, Charlie. Oh, the show is called Charlie B Company, just like the shirt here, right I there. I thought I said that. But <laughs> Charlie B I'm Company. You can find me on the TikTok and Instagram and all that stuff too. I post. I do a lot of bee removal. That's a big part of my life. Bee removal. Uh, I do one a day at least, and so I'm always sticking my nose in a beehive. And then I'll do. I do the ag leasing piece. I I teach a little beekeeping. Uh, do all kinds of stuff and in fact we're moving to some some land we bought some raw land we're going to move out to and start uh, just expand our little bee operation a little bit more so that's awesome and you know yeah. I follow him follow him on Facebook and on TikTok and all of the other social media things because it truly you're a hoot to follow um, I want to uh, backtrack just a smidge and say that um, speaking of honey, because we are really um, in the southern portion of the United States, really getting post honey talk. So I did a in that theme, I did an article for the August issue that just came out and it's called pricing your honey on social media. It is uh, it's all the buzz. Forgive that. But I'm bum. I, it really and truly people don't know. And I want you to go to that article. It's um, 
it's it's pretty good about how you do it. It truly, if you want to know about James and Sherry, how we do it, that's who I tell you. We that's how I tell you to do it. You just lay everything out of what it costs you to do business, what your market is around you. Um, you know, Charlie's in the New Braunfels area. I don't. What, what's a pound of honey going for in your area? You know, I've just finished harvest. I've got a, a living room full of five gallon buckets. My wife, my wife loves that about three thousand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, we haven't set a price yet. I was at one dollar an ounce last year at sixteen dollars, and people said, "Oh, that's astronomical." But I'm hearing uh, people at twenty dollars a pound this year, and I don't. I. I I don't know. I want to find somewhere in the middle, maybe 18. Yeah. But ultimately, if you're a if you're a small boutique honey producer, it's a different product than the than the honey that you buy that comes out of North Dakota or wherever. And that clover honey, they're they're selling those large scale beekeepers are selling that as a commodity. And if you're selling it, if you're handing it to the customer, you're not. We're not in the commodity business yet. And so I I don't sell my my honey as a commodity. I sell it as a it's a it's a standalone product and you know where it came from, you know, it's raw, you know, um, so well, it's a niche market. It truly is. I mean, we are not, and I even quote the, the commodities market. If y'all are curious of what that cost is right now, you do not want to be in that price. It's part. like $3, $2, okay, it's ridiculous. $2, uh, $2.26 yeah. a pound. So um, we're not that, and y'all have to read the article, see what we are, but it's our market. You know, we get what we can. What do you, what do you get? Come on, you get to tell me. Okay, so we're at um, we're twelve dollars for a pint, twenty dollars for a quart, and thirty five for a half gallon. Oh, what are the what's the weight of that though? What's a um, what, a pound and a half for a pint, three three okay. pounds for a quart. That's cheap. Then, okay, I want to go buy some your honey and resell it now. I never do that. I never do <laughs> I mean, that. Good, but you know uh, we we don't want to carry over to the next year. You know right. we don't want to carry. I don't want to take um, you know. A thousand pounds of honey into next year. It uh, what, I, what I've run into personally is running out of honey, and then you're a beekeeper that doesn't have honey, and that's a drag. And I get a lot of people sending me emails from you know places our shows playing, and they're like, "Please ship us honey." I don't ship honey, but mm-hmm. I just I just hate not having it. Yeah. So I sometimes you know I soft pedal. <laughs> no, no, I get that. I get that. And a lot of, but there's a lot of beekeepers in my area. So, I mean, we've got tons of competition. Hey, let's talk about um, feeding. So, you know, we, Blake said a lot about it. I do want to tell folks that, you know, Blake showed Stan's shot, soft sugar bricks there at the end and how, how that is working. Wonderful product. Um, we've got plenty in stock, but don't be surprised just from tonight and that video that if you see, you know, we're running low or, or it says running out, don't worry. We're constantly making more. If you've got a question, and that goes for the next one I'm going to talk about too, global patties, you know, that's superior product. You saw that in the ads going at the uh, before the show started. Global with complete that Blake talked about. And then we've also got global with Apis Biologics, which is an incredibly good product. Um, right now, we're about a week out on getting some uh, global with Apis Biologics, but it's coming. So y'all just hold you horses. And if you've ever got a question about something that um, you see sold out on there, pick up the phone 1-800-356-4229 and call and talk to somebody say when. I want to know when and, and put my name and ship it the minute it gets there. Uh, someone ask a question? Somebody can ask a question. What's Gladys. What? Found, Gladys, her name is Gladys. Gladys, her name. Found hundreds and hundreds of dead bees outside the front mm. of the box. And their tongues are sticking out. Oh, dear. Gladys. That's a sad event. Um, Charlie, would you describe uh, your experience <laughs> with bees that have died like that? Uh, what you believe the cause is, and and uh, can our neighbors help us in overcoming such mm-hmm. events? Yeah, so this the tongue sticking out thing is a is a bad indication of uh, they've been poisoned. So I hate that. I see. I very rarely see it. Um, I have one yard that I run into it a lot, and it's near. It's in farm country. So I think um, someone's. You know, I think if people properly use. Uh, whatever they're whatever they're putting on their on on their grass or whatever it's fine but when they're misusing that's when it can really affect bees um yeah that's a that's a tragedy um 
and it could be anyone within three to five miles, which is, mm -hmm. which is tough. So. Yeah, we've had that happen too, y'all. It's sad. Um, we wrote, uh, there's an article in just a few months back. Go back, Gladys, and check the, uh, the Bee Supply Monthly Magazine. Even go in in the search and the Bee Help, and it should pull up some information about how you can kind of, at times, you can help. Uh, if, right, if you catch it right at the beginning, you can kind of help maybe save them. Not always, but, but sometimes. Um, I'm going to grab another one here from Dwight Hewlin. Um, if you do a paper combined of two colonies, how long does it take for them to choose through the paper? In other words, how long do you leave them alone before checking on them? That's a good question. So I do I do combines really a lot. So I end up with I do removal work. So I end up dumping little colonies and swarms into my my yard where I'm hoping to keep them. Don't always keep them. Sometimes they don't decide to stay. Sometimes they're queenless, right? Sometimes they're weak. So I really, we're coming up on the season where I start to get real merciless and they got to have a, a, a really a big cluster of bees to survive winter, uh, a critical mass of bees. My, my fr friend and mentor, Gret Mark Gretchen says, so you got to, uh, if they don't have that critical mass, I'll combine them with other colonies. I'll choose which queen I like, or I'll, I'll introduce a queen that I bought from a queen breeder. But um, yeah, the paper, combo works great um they they do it pretty quick it's like a couple of days really i find um it's just slowing them down long enough to sort of chew in between the paper and the two boxes um i've been out in yards and i didn't have paper and i said ladies you're gonna have to get along <laughs> we have to <laughs> so, but i, I can, make up. <laughs> yeah i I'm, i can be pretty uh slam bang out in the bee yards when I'm doing lots and lots of removals, but mm -hmm. certainly really good strategy for um, getting your colonies up to strength and size and quantity of bees. Right. Um, one thing you can do to expedite it and give them a little help is just cut a little slit um, oh, yeah. in that paper and just, you know, just barely just little slits and that that goes a long way um, for making them getting getting fast through it. Um, Let's see, I'm going to find another one. Treated for Varroa, this is James Hagen. Treated for Varroa and had crawling bees in the bee yard. Is this residual virus or what other factors could cause crawling bees with well-formed wings? So in other words, not deformed wing virus. I don't, I don't see crawling wings often, uh, Cherry and James, any ideas? Um, treated for Varroa and then had crawling bees in the bee yard. I'm going to say maybe two things. I don't know what you treated with, James, but um, some of the treatments are fumigants and the bees just, <laughs> they don't like it and they might not fare as well. And you might see some crawling around after that. Had some friends um last year I believe it was used some treatment that um, we questioned they had the hive not do well at all after a treatment and it was because the population didn't meet the treatment directions so that's real important for folks that are treating with any kind of a treatment is to make sure that you're reading the directions very well like um, apivar for instance five frames one one uh, tab per five frames of, of bees. Um, and, you know, you do more than that, then you're going to have a bad reaction. I don't know if that's what happened, James, but maybe. Um, bees crawling on the ground sometimes can just be that you're seeing them die. You know, it's the end of their lifetime. So I, I don't Isn't know. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I hate to interrupt here, but we moved, we moved um, 17 colonies into our small backyard. <laughs> A few months ago, I'm not supposed to tell him, but our, our neighbors don't watch, <laughs> and uh, they're like uh, up against the house and up against the RV and up against the shed, and they're everywhere. Fortunately, they're good, sweet bees, but we, for the first time in our lives, are seeing bees on the ground mm -hmm. dying. Mm -hmm. But it's just one here, one yeah. there, but there's always some dying, yeah. And we we uh, have to believe because we we rule out the probability of poisoning that there are just so many bees coming into one location that we're seeing natural death occur during mm -hmm. the summer drought. Mm -hmm. um, 
we don't, we have no accumulation of bees mm -mm. and the bees are just sitting there kind of doing their thing and they finally pass away. I think it's because we're not, we're used to being on a farm. And so Charlie, you're fixing to do the reverse. You're, you're fixing to be on that farm with your bees, but we were on a farm for who years. And then now they're in a half acre where we're seeing them. And I think that we just weren't seeing them. I before. think so too. Good input. And we're also on crushed granite around them <laughs> yeah. as opposed to grass. Right. So we see all of them that are coming back to the hive and not quite making it. Yeah. So it can be something natural as well as something um, detrimental. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the accumulation effect that you have to worry about. Exactly. Good point. The dead bees I'm seeing this time of year are mostly robbing. I'm getting, being oh. in the middle of the dearth, I'm getting hives. You know, I have some yards with big monsters, big monster, you know, multi, multi-level hives and then little tiny hives. And I try to equalize them a little bit. I'll share resources like, like Blake did in the video, brood or even, even, uh, uh, food. So, you know, a honey frame, move it into a weaker hive but you know if I feed I want to feed universally and also feed based on how big the colony is if I'm feeding sugar water I don't want to give gallons to a tiny little weak hive because that just says come and take it and so they get yeah. their best I'm gonna um, that that is I'm gonna call that a segue so there's a couple of points in um, the program that I wanted to hit that um, when we're feeding syrup, especially this time of year, there's a fine line of overfed and well fed. So we want our larva to be floating in that beautiful royal jelly uh, bee bread solution. Looks a little milky, right? If you're seeing dry brood, if you're, they're not, you don't see that milky around the larva, that means you're shy on pollen of all things. To me, that's seems backwards in the realm of logic, but it's not. Pollen has to be consumed by the bees in order for their hypopharyngeal glands to emit royal jelly and for that all to work. And without that pollen, it comes out dry. So if you're seeing dry brood right now, you're needing pollen, not, not liquid feed in the form of syrup. And having said that, on the syrup end, we really want to watch and make sure that we are at that sweet spot, pun intended probably, that we aren't, they aren't hoarding it so much that they're backfilling the brood nest because the queen still is laying. Even though a lot of areas get so hot, she slows down. Um, you really wanna make sure that she's not backfilling that brood nest and there's just a ton of syrup sitting in the brood nest. So that fine line, Blake's, you know, talking about putting um, spare boxes on top for the bees to have breathing room and to have air and so forth. That also gives them room to store some more honey if you need to um, in that respect. Last thing I'm going to say, and then we'll give it to you, um, Charlie, is that if you want to feed area feeding, mm -hmm, I'm, um, we've done it. It's just, just kind of your bad. Yeah. And James is right. It's, it's got what ends up happening so often is that um, the weak hive that you want to have the syrup doesn't get it. And the ones that don't need all the feed are the hoarders and, and all the neighborhood bees. So I, we can't stress enough that, you know, sugar is expensive. Um, I'd feed inside. What's your thought on that? I always feed inside. I never open feed. I, I, um, it's too expensive to, for me to feed the neighborhood bees or other people's mm -hmm. bees. I think too that, like Blake said, this time of year, bees are kind of on a little stasis. So brood rearing is going to reduce. And I don't want to pretend like there's a flow. My, so my understanding, I got this from Michael Bush. He's a, he's a big bee teacher guy. And he said, you know, when we pour sugar syrup into a container inside the hive, that the bees don't get that feedback loop. So it doesn't induce them to say like, we're in a flow, it's great. They're, they kind of react like, oh, there's a spill in the hive. We've got to clean this up, right? right? And it satisfies the need for them, the, the, the nutritional needs, but it doesn't like in, induce them to start rearing a ton of brood, but it will. But, and actually this time of year, I don't want my hives to be brooding up because I can't afford to keep them in brood. I'm waiting till uh, early September, things cool a little bit-ish, 
we get a might get a little rain eventually and then they get that little fall flow and they build up for winter but if i start now and try to push them to to, to thrive they're not going to do it they're not building comb there it's hard to push them to build comb um that said if i've got a split and which I split pretty aggressively any any time of year except midwinter. Um, I I want to make sure they're they're well fed and encouraged and protected. You know, right size and um, hive entrance, their their entrance reducer or whatever the case. So that's good. That's good stuff right there. Um, and you know, when we say feed pollen patties, because like through a, a global patty on there, you know, we're, we're probably at that 4% global patty with complete or apis biologics, but those aren't brood busters, okay? Those, those bees are consuming that. The, the pollen patties they're consuming. This isn't really the time that we put out dry pollen. They'll store dry pollen, but they'll consume the pollen patties. That's not a storing, all right? That's more the get healthy type thing. So you're not really looking at that. And, and Charlie, you are exactly right. We, we, we don't want to get ahead of that game. September, the issue I started on um, a week ago, and all of the articles that are coming in the September issue, we're going to start talking about building winter bees. And building winter bees is a big deal. We, we've got to start that health and get that healthy really going for winter um, and, and like Blake said it's really this time of year for me it's about mites we're at the highest yeah. mite count we're going to have yeah. highest populations I'm going to try to knock down those mite populations as much as I can mm -hmm. and then and then come into fall you know just uh, it's it's kind of like a you stop the flow, you stop the bleeding on mites. So I feel like it's exactly. just, yeah never... let's talk about that for a little bit so on on mites you know, this is our come off, and you're right. So we've come off of the of the nectar flow, and and if you've seen that graph, it goes up, and we get the peak of of bees, and also the peak of mites. But the mites stay level, right? And the bees start to drop, but then your mite population stays there well beyond that bee population dropping, and that's the July, August, September even into October, that our mite populations are, if you've got one, are through the roof and we have got to attack them. So one of the indicators, and, and most of us, and you know, even if you didn't buy your bees from TBS, most bee breeders are selling um, BSH type bees, queens that are varroa sensitive hygienic. They've got, you know, decent hygienic traits. And in doing so, they are, they're, what we call ball brood. They're decapping when they sense uh, a mite running around in underneath that cap cell, they will decap that pupa. First of all, that kills the pupa, but it also kills the developing varroa mites, right? Um, if you see that in a line, in a linear, you know, where it looks like it's, they're drawing a line, the bees didn't do that. Do you know what that is? That's wax moths tunneling underneath, underneath that cell, creating the, the basically the people are being popped out the top. So if you see that, that may not be a good thing, okay? You might need to look a little bit further. So I, I just wanna say that balding brood is a, is a good, good, bad thing. It shows you that your bees are working on the Varroa, um, but if you see a linear line, you might wanna look twice and see if you see some developing wax moth larvae. If you have wax moth, you're, you're in major trouble, I find. Like, there's just no, there's no good day that I see wax moth. It, it means I've got way too much space, or the hive is in decline. And so many, so many beekeepers tell me, oh, wax moth killed my bees. And I tell them, wax moth doesn't do it. I'm the one who kills the bees, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> and then the wax moth comes in and cleans up my mess that, that I created. That's so true. And I do hear that quite a bit too. And it's unfortunate. But, you know, if you don't know, you don't know. And that's, you know, we just, I, I didn't know until I knew. You That's know. true. And the first time I saw a small hive beetle, I was like, Varroa mites are going to kill this hive. No, it's a small hive beetle. I mean, yeah. The, you, you now, know. you know what somebody told me, and this was the one that really cracked me up, was that I have maggots. They said they had maggots. And I went, what? Oh, oh, you've got small hive beetle larva. So those, yeah, that's that's not good. Do we have any questions there? Let me peek real quick. Uh, with, uh, 
Oh, can I, James, can a drone fit between an excluder? I'm going to be James for a moment. A drone most often cannot quit, fit through a queen excluder. So, no. If, if a drone dives on top of a queen excluder, then we had brood up top, didn't we? And if it dies on top of a queen excluder, can it look like a queen? Yes. What? What can it look queen, like? Queen down below. Uh -huh. uh, if, if there's a drone up above it, there must have been brood up. Then there. it was brood up above it. Uh -huh. And if a drone dies on top of a queen excluder, uh -huh. can it look like a black blob? That was a question that someone had. Mm. What does a drone look like as it deteriorates within a colony? Does it just decay or does it like? Get greasy and got me. Throw those those queen excluders away. I'm one of those guys. So oh, are you? Are you? A, oh, you're an anti. You're an anti queen excluder. So my the guy who taught me called them honey excluders. It means yeah. like slows the bees down. But I also find if the bees need to make more brood, brood, let them go. Let them build it. And and when I harvest honey, I'm not harvesting honey. I mean, and I harvest a fair bit of honey. I'm still, yeah. I'm still picking the frames apart and looking at it, making sure there's no brood on it or whatever. So I, if there's brood, I don't take it. And so why, you know, the, the, the queen excluder, I use more as a tool for pushing bees around, doing divides, doing the do little split, um, yeah. you, know, ex, you know, excluding, making, locking my queen in, that kind of thing. So. Somebody asked something about OA, and that's, you know, you are not on your own planet with the, the queen excluders. I'm going to say it's probably 50-50, those that do and those that don't. Um, with this heat, should I hold off on using OA vaporizing to treat mites? So those that don't know, that's oxalic acid. And I mean, it's done by sublimation, so vaporizing in there. But it is typically used for broodless cycles. So um, it's really not very effective right now. I would hold off until late time to do it. If you just want to do it, then you're going to have to do it multiple times. You're going to have to do it every brood cycle. So you have to do it about once a week uh, for about, gosh, what, three weeks, four weeks? Yeah, and why is that? Because you need, to, because you're, the bees that are emerging out of the cell that are pulling those living mites out with them, setting, setting them free, that's the only ones that the OA is going to kill. They can't, it, the OA doesn't get below the capping. So it's just, it's just not a great summer. The heat really has nothing to do with it. I mean, you could do it now or anytime, but it's just not going to be very effective. You really ought to try something else. If you're looking at organics, the heat is a big deal because um, OA is an organic. We've got uh, formic acid in the um, form of Mottaway quick strips, um, but that is a 95, I believe, um, threshold heat index. Heat index, heat heat threshold. So we are we are we're, I don't know about where you are, but uh, be careful with that. Um, Apa guards 105. Um, anything over 105, and that's also uh, that's thymol based. That's an organic. A treatment you can use that and that that's a pretty good treatment right now um apivar is a, is a synthetic but um it can be used right now if you've got a high mite load and that's a good rule of thumb i even put that in the the august issue that if you've got a high mite load and you really need to bang them out get them gone apivar is a good get or get her done um it, if uh, you're kind of a slow don't have that many but want to treat apigard is a fumigant and can be for if you got just a lower threshold, it, it works pretty good for that. So anyway, um, I want to talk about drawing next year's foundation. Do you do that, Charlie? Do you set yourself up to draw next year foundation? I don't even know what you're talking about. So, so if I so like like was talking about trickle feeding. Mm -hmm. So if I had a colony that was really doing well and I'm you know, it's heat in the summer. It doesn't hurt to put a brand new box, brand new foundation on top of them. And while they're trickle feeding, they will build out the comb on that box and just do that. Not even add any brood, not even add any syrup to it. So building on next year's boxes, you'll have to, of course, store them over winter. But have you ever done that? I don't consciously like raise comb, but I always just think about if the bees need more space I just give them more space and gotcha. if, even if they're a strong colony so Blake's Blake Blake suggested not feeding a hive that has a lot of stores on 
I feed them. I, if I'm feeding the others and I'm right there, I, I feed with a big old 40 gallon tank and pump it. So I'll say, here, have a little bit of this. It encourages them. And then I'll, if, if in fact they have that buffer box, which I do quite often, yeah. that extra box on top to give them some space, they'll fill that out. And, you know, drawn comb is money. Drawn comb is so valuable. <laughs> Come spring, come you know, do, doing hive divides or even buying, you know, nukes and packages and being able to give those bees that jump start. Oh yeah, that's that's money right there. Well, and 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 we we do actually grow comb, and that sounds so funny, but um, for years it took us, you know, it takes a, takes a minute to get a back stock of honey supers, and in order to do that, we we grew comb for for quite a long time. It gives the bees busy work. Those that are interested in doing it, just just get you a um, new foundation, new new boxes, whatever you want to do, and just put it on top of a good strong hive and feed, 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 feed. You know, I, I actually use my honey supers uh, as expansion. So I'm a big configuring my hives. I'm a big fan of the story and a half. I run a lot of eight frame, but also ten frame. I do a deep box on the bottom and then a medium, six and five eighths inches, smaller box on top. The challenge with that is you can't put the big frames in the little box, right? That's a pain. So you can't, they're not interchangeable. Whereas a lot of most, you know, conventional beekeepers, it's a deep and a deep, but Texas, a deep and a medium does just fine. Well, that medium, I can, let's say I've got a weaker colony. I'll take a recently extracted honey super, right? That I might have to store for winter because it's got all that nice comb on it and I don't want to have the wax moth get it. And I'll just put that on a hive that needs a little extra space and boom, they love that. They build that out. So I, I'll go ahead and I'll use up my, uh, use up some of my uh, drawn comb from Honey Supers. The key there though, is if you're, if you're doing that and you use something like Apovar, you then cannot, you cannot use those frames that have touched Apovar as Supers again, right? So once, once they go brood, brood yeah. frame they're brood frames and um so I, I end up kind of and i'm always expanding so i get more honey supers and honey uh, uh mediums every year so yeah and i'm glad you said that because blake blake had some treatments on the hives that he was working in the video and and if he's putting in a a, a a used honey super on there that's for the bees from now on folks you need to know that we wouldn't put that in the mix for consumable honey that that turns into bees honey because it's just I mean we wouldn't we wouldn't do that it, it just really isn't isn't great to to have any kind of chemical in our in our honey and that said though oxalic I guess it's not official but you can you can do it's not official but people are doing oxalic when there are supers on mm -hmm. I don't do that but I'm I'm more comfortable with oxalic uh, like you said, it's not that effective this time of year. It's cheap though. It is cheap. <laughs> the, the actual, the actual, uh, the oxalic acid powder is cheap. So if I, if, if yeah. I've got a lot of it, um, it's cheaper than Apovar certainly, but it's, it's labor intensive. I got to time it. And if you're like me, I got hives all over the place. So I've got to make my rounds and time it and write it all down. So Apovar makes it, um, it saves me that, that run around, but yeah, and it and James just said it requires a delivery method. The the OA does well. A lot of folks dribble it. I was never comfortable with dribbling. Um, good old friend from Beekeepers Past was big on dribble method, and I just I really it, it made me nervous because I always heard that if you got it on the cappings that it could kill or on the bees it could kill bees. I thought oh, I don't do that. I, I think too with the uh, with. Um treatment and dealing if you're treat you know using treatment it's helpful i think to have a mentor who's keeping bees alive and then learn what treatments they're using and then you learn those methodologies i think uh this webinar is real helpful for that i mean i, I get kind of mentoring from blake and from, sure. from the articles but i think it's also just nice to hit like someone in your area hey are you are you using treatment what are you using so then i got you know, once I knew how to use oxalic and made it work, right? So I did, a, I test for mites before and I test for mites after and it worked, aha, like I kind of got that, right? So that's a new tool in my tool belt. So kind of trying, I might not go whole hog on one treatment that I've never used and bought a whole bunch of it for all my hives. I might buy a little bit of it and mm -hmm. try it on this hive and see, and see how it goes. So. 
Well, and I think the main thing is testing because, you know, we we really the last thing we want to do in these webinars is to insinuate that everybody should treat because no, we, we don't. It's like saying I'm going to take antibiotics just in case I get sick. No, so I want, yeah, right. it just doesn't work. So we really, really want you to test. And one thing that I think that we like Blake's on on this page that we kind of have been migrating to is that the alcohol wash is for new beekeepers and even some with some experience is just it's just tough. I, I, you know, I do the sugar roll, baby. I like to crawl <laughs> or out. The of sticky sugar. Board, or the sticky board. I don't like sticky. to kill bees. On I know. Alcohol I know. But it's much more accurate, right? So yes. well, I say good. much more. But you know what our theory on this is? And, and I'm not getting, don't send me letters on this, you know, because this beekeeping, it's experience and opinion based, right? What works for us? So James and I did sugar shakes for years, didn't we? That was the powdered sugar, powdered sugar, little ghosty bees. We did that for years. And then we started not all that long ago, just throw a sticky board in there. If you see very many in 24 hours, you know? It really doesn't matter if it's three or 10, you still have to do something. But you know, the thing that we overlook quite often is what- I can't uh, see your face. The thing we- we overlook so often is that while we dislike Africanized bees so much and, and you run into those tendencies a lot with your removals, uh, Africanized colonies are pretty much might free. And the reason <laughs> they are is not because they're so mean, it's because they change locations so often, it's which so means true. it's a brood break. Yeah. Brood breaks and hobby beekeepers yeah. is a very effective way to control varroa mites during periods of requeening, during periods of splitting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's such a, such a benefit for hobby beekeepers yeah. to, to take advantage of and save that treatment process, at least early spring or after, your, after you've extracted your honey, you can work it in somewhere where it's beneficial to you. That's a great, yeah, that's good. That's good. I think splitting is the is the, the most underrated thing in beekeeping. As a second year beekeeper or six months into beekeeping, you might be thinking about splitting right away. And you do get that brood break. And you do, mm -hmm. you also have those kind of right size colonies. I have a bee in Texas and in the South and our, our winters usually aren't too tough. I overwinter small colonies, little, little more than a nuke. And they do fine. I, you, you know, I'll make the uh, stand sugar brick if I, if I feel magnanimous at Christmas time and want, to, want <laughs> a little bit extra. Yeah, but it's but a good product. <laughs> they do fine. They do fine. Um, no, they really do. That's a very good point. And so we've still got this queens until probably September, right? Um, Requeen if you want, or make splits. Summer splits need to be stronger. You said that a while ago, didn't you, at the beginning? And um, they really need to be stronger. But it's there's nothing wrong with doing a split this time of year. It just has to be strong. You need to feed it before you uh, requeen, and then um, and then after. Do, as well. uh, do we have time to discuss brood breaks a little further? Now, someone's unclear what we're talking about. And, oh yeah. Uh, I'll ask if we can do it in another session, but we can do it right now, Barbara. A brood break. A brood break is so the life cycle. We've got three minutes left, so I'm gonna make it very quick. Um, the life cycle of the role is that the 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 female mite goes into a cell right prior to it being capped, and she lays a male uh, varroa, and then she lays a female varroa. And by that time, the cell has been capped, and that male and female varroa sit there and they mate. Every 30 hours, they're making another varroa. Okay, so a brood break stops that brood cycle, brood bees brood cycle, where you shut the production of mites down, not only the production of bees down, but the production of mites down. And so when you do that, it is a varroa control, because if we can just even queen trapping is very, very well known, you just get some screen wire, they actually make pre-made devices that you just trap the queen and leave her trapped for a period of time and it just stops her from laying all out here and that allows brood to emerge and just gives the, the colony a break for a second from varroa reproducing right charlie yeah brood breaks are great i mean uh, uh, winter time is just a natural brood break it is. it's not great 
and splits do that. And that's where, where James is. So we are almost out of time. I can't believe we made it to eight. Awesome. Charlie Agar, tell us how to find you again. CharlieB.com. You can, you can Google me on, uh, on the Instagrams and the TikToks and whatnot. And uh, I want to thank y'all for doing this. I think this is such an awesome, the, the magazine and the monthly webinar is such a useful resource because learning beekeeping is not an event. It's an ongoing thing. You know, it's always going to have questions, always fires to put out. So glad y'all are here. Thank you.